Hey, welcome to another episode of Cutter One. I am your host, Jay, just Jay, your resident troublemaker and your resident culture warrior. I hope all you beautiful badasses are doing well on this lovely day, I suppose. Um, wherever you are, I hope it's lovely wherever you are. Uh, just a little housekeeping. This is the 100th episode. The 100th episode, all right? I've actually done this 100 times. Um, that's a freaking lot. But... um. At the, as the 100th episode, I just wanted to say thank you for those of you who joined in and have come along for the ride so far. Um, we're still small. We're like that, that, we're like that fellowship, right? Like in the larger world. Like, but, but before you know it, we'll have the riders of Rohan and the men of Gondor with us. But right now, we're just our little fellowship. But every day is a new day, and we have a, another chance of getting our voices heard and getting the word out and defending Tolkien and his works. So uh, let's get right into it. Um, you guys are going to be seeing this on Wednesday, right? I'm actually, right now when I'm recording, it's Tuesday evening here where I'm at. But you guys are going to be seeing it on Wednesday. Eastern daylight time, right? Um, and it, depending on your part of the world, right? So you guys are going to be seeing this on Wednesday, but if you're aware, um, the two year, I'm sorry, the two, the 20 year anniversary of the two towers um, was recently. It was actually on the 18th of December, at least here in the States, which is when it, December 18th, 2002 was when the two towers premiered in, in movie theaters here in the United States. So it's the 20th anniversary. Um, and because of that, you saw that there was an uptick in, in Lord of the Rings related stuff, right? Around the interwebs, you know, articles, news stories, and so on and so forth. Some just talking about it being the 20th anniversary. Others putting a spin on it and sort of trying to draw connections and correlations and causations between, you know, the Peter Jackson adaptations and, and, um, the Amazon adaptation, uh, rings of power and Tolkien's works. But anyway, um, so that just, I, I saw this article, um, a couple of days ago and I sort of hemmed and hawed on whether or not I wanted to get into it because there's some things I'm kind of like, okay, yeah, I can agree with. And some things I'm kind of like, mm, lady, no, but all right, you know what? L let's just go and we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll pick it apart. All right, let's get right into it. Okay. And this is coming to us from Collider from one Kelsey Mattison or Matson. Um, and it says Eowyn walked. So rings of powers, Galadriel, could run. 20 years after the two towers debuted, Eowyn's strength paved the way for Galadriel to shine. Okay. Um, I'm already not liking the premise that um, Eowyn, um, as portrayed by Miranda Otto, um, somehow was less than Morfred Clark's, you know, Xena warrior. I'm sorry, Guy Ladriel. But let's get into it. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, two decades before an armored Galadriel, Morfid Clark, started, slashed her way through enemy hordes in Amazon's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, Eowyn, Miranda Otto, made her silver screen debut in director Peter Jackson's adaptation of The Two Towers. Already a fan favorite of women who were raised on J.R.R. Tolkien's work, Eowyn in the cinematic flesh was electric electrifying even before her I am no man denouement in The Return of the King. Her passionate, desperate fight for identity struck a chord with this particular 13-year-old girl's soul so deeply that Eowyn has remained one of many fictional inspirations for 20 years and counting. This year, Rings of Power introduced a Galadriel with shared traits, both stylistic and thematic, swords and armor and rage, a fierce devotion to family, and a life spent uh, chafing under the trivialization, yeah, trivializing judgment of her people. Now that I'm 30, a 33 year old woman, Rings Galadriel accorded me a new fictional hero in a familiar world. Because with a fellowship composed of nine men, Eowyn was my generation's closest link to feeling included in Tolkien's adventure. This time in 2022, Galadriel is the undeniable, prota undeniable protagonist. All right, um, so I, stop right there. First of all, um, Kelsey, I would dare to say that um 
you know, it, it, because with a fellowship composed of nine men, Eowyn was my generation's closest link to feeling included, included in Tolkien's adventure. It's interesting that you say that because it seems to me right out of the gate, and this is after just one paragraph, it seems to me that you want a specific type of character to be presented so that you could sort of self-insert yourself there um and that is the morford clark galadriel um uh, uh, like or as i like to say um insufferable bitch galadriel um and and yes i will use that term you can call me whatever is name you want i don't care but i'm just saying because that's how she comes across now i love miranda otto's um portrayal of of Eowyn. Actually so much to, that my niece um I my niece is named Eowyn. Um my sister loved the character so much Eowyn as portrayed by Miranda Otto that she named her daughter um after after the character. So yes, I have a niece um named Eowyn after the character Eowyn, right? Even it's even spelled the same way, the E O W Y N. Um having said that, it's interesting that the only way you could feel linked to um the lord of the rings um you you could not find the way to empathize empathize or identify with any of the male characters um you can only do that with characters of your same gender which is what i take um by that that last sentence there because with a fellowship composed of nine men eowyn was my generation's closest link to feeling included in tolkien's adventure this time it's galadriel um kate blanchett's Portrayal of Galadriel didn't do it for you. Um, Liv Tyler as Arwen did nothing. Okay. It was only the chick that was going to fight, apparently, was the only one that mattered. But let's see what else uh, Miss Matson has to say. Eowyn lives in a cage. The Eowyn introduced to audiences in the Two Towers is a woman pacing back and forth inside a self-described cage. The facts do her sentiments credit. Her cousin, Theodrid, Paris House Strua, uh, sustained fatal wounds from the Orakai. Her brother, Aomer, Carl Urban, is in exile, and she's watched firsthand as her beloved uncle, King Theoden, Bernard Hill, deteriorates in mind and body between the duplicitous council of Grima Wormtongue, Brad Dorif, and magical possession by Saruman, Christopher Lee. Um, the, these tragedies are just more in a long line as both her parents passed when she was a child. If that wasn't anguish enough, the role she's required to fulfill as a lady of Rohan is also her greatest fear made manifest, a life trapped within the castle walls, where her greatest merit is serving drinks to powerful men, not to mention the looming presence of Wormtongue, who wants her as a reward for his loyalty to Saruman and therefore preys upon her grief. Unfortunately, the slimy creep accurately and eloquently distills the sheer weight of Eowyn's loneliness. Quote, In the bitter watches of the night, he describes... When all your life seems to shrink, the walls of your bower closing in about you, a hutch to trammel some wild thing in, unquote. Eowyn's indeed a wild thing when embodied uh, by the nigh-miraculous Miranda Otto. For all of Eowyn's nobility, Otto instills her with a constant sense of skittish tension, her body language cautious and defensive, just take the feral fury in her eyes during the brief scuffle with Aragorn, Viggo Mortensen. The exceptions are rare and not easy to earn. The little smile when she raises a sword and, run, and runs one palm down the side before shifting into combat practice. Her laughter with Gimli, John Rhys Davies, and the vulnerable hope of her infatuation with Aragorn. Her brother Aomir might, Aomir might adore her, but this poor woman has spent the majority of her life fighting tooth and nail for every scrap of freedom. It's no wonder she falls for Aragorn when he's the first person to not only respect the mournful resilience inside Eowyn, but offer her hope. Okay, I'll, I'm not going to say anything. Um... Uh, in the letter of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author describes Eowyn, in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author describes Eowyn as, quote, not really a soldier or Amazon, but like many grave women, was capable of great military gallantry at a crisis, unquote. It's not a stretch to assume that Tolkien based Eowyn on the women who served alongside him during World War I. 
especially those who laid claim to a sense of identity through service and strove to earn autonomous respect in the only ways available to them under a patriarchal system. It, okay, um, Kelsey, d um, I'm, I, you don't take this as mansplaining. No women served alongside Tolkien in the trenches of Europe in World War I. Let me say that again. For those in the back who may not have heard it, no women served alongside Tolkien or any other man in the trenches of World War I. Okay, so right away, like you clearly are just like sort of filling in gaps to, to make it fit your narrative. Um, and I, I can understand why you would do that, but also as a, a person who is writing articles for a you know to get published on a news website, um, you should know better. You're you're literally just making that up. It is it is a factual um, inaccuracy. Okay, it just did not happen. Don't believe me? Google it. Google's your friend. Google it. Women did not serve in the front lines of World War One. Period. Stop. Full stop. End of story. That's where Tolkien was. The front lines in World War One. So no women served alongside him. Now, if you're talking about women in support roles and ancillary roles, there were there were um, it was more home front stuff in World War One. You really see um, women becoming more active in a support role in World War Two, where you have uh, Wax WACs, which were like the women that would fly once the the factories pumped out the like aircraft these were the women who would pilot the aircraft and fly them over to england so that the air crews in england can then take them and use them you know for whatever missions they needed them for so it's world war ii you really see women start to get more involved in directly in supporting the war um but in world war one no i'm sorry tolkien was there was no women around tolkien that was serving alongside him in the trenches of world war one that's just not true um Okay, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. okay, we, it didn't take us long to get to the word patriarchy in this. Uh, similar restrictions suffocate Eowyn. She isn't empowered by the responsibility of protecting the women and children. Let's, let's say that again. She isn't empowered by the responsibility of protecting the women and children. It's just another dismissal of her wishes and potential by the people who control her future. It's interesting, Kelsey, that you would say that because that is exactly what men are born and raised to do. Men, from a the minute we are little boys, you know, hanging on our, our, our mom's, you know, skirt, you know, we are raised that our job is to protect the women and children. I mean, come on, when a boat is sinking, who are the first people they say to let to get off the boat? The women and children, right? Our um our jobs are to protect the women and children. So I think it's interesting that you say that it's that that is not empowering for her. Like literally in that one sentence, a you're saying that Aowen gets treated just like the men around her. Okay, it's just it's not on your terms. And that's what you have the problem with. And that's what a lot of women nowadays would have the problem with. It's not that what you're doing isn't empowering, but the fact that it's not playing out the way you want it to play out makes it less than empowering, okay? Eowyn was given the job of protecting the, the women and children. Why were all the men at Helm's Deep or in Rohan fighting to begin with? The men were fighting not because they were bored and had nothing to do, because they wanted to protect the women and children. But um, anyway, and it's just another dismissal of her wishes and potential by the people who control her future. Again, because it doesn't play out the way you want it to play out. Okay. Uh, one could be d debate all day whether it was safer for her sake, but it's still restrictive. Swap in the... Swap in the real world and any career field dominated by men, and Eowyn represents the universal experience of almost all women involved in said vocations. Right, because unless it's their way, they tend to complain. And, you know, it's interesting because um, you say in a field dominated by men, um, how many women are out there struggling to be the bestest bricklayers ever? You know, what you're talking about is like CEO jobs, management level jobs, you know, jobs where you sit in an office all day. Um, that That's what you're talking about. 
um, not out there doing roofing or brick laying or, you know, um, cleaning septic tanks or anything like that. And it, you're, it's totally okay for the men to take the lead on that one. But I digress. Eowyn's struggles made her a heroic inspiration. As the female character with the most screen time, as well as the one actively vying to jump into the fray, Eowyn was always the character I felt the closest kinship with. Okay, nothing wrong there. My adoration of Middle-earth never wavered, but there was still an unnamed sense of exclusion as I grew up with the novels and Jackson's films in close succession. That's a you problem, though. Um, when I imagined joining the fellowship on their quest, it meant inserting myself into the story as a teenage girl's original creation. Eowyn and I always hovered on the sidelines, which admittedly is in large part the factor making her destruction of the witch king of Angmar so affecting. Through her, I saw what I could be. I felt undefeatable in her moment of victory, yet I was never the recognized and respected main character. And there you go. There's the crux of what Kelsey's trying to say here, is that um, it doesn't count unless the woman is the main character. Okay? And I got a feeling she's going to use Morphid Clark's Galadriel as proof of this. Um, for a time, Eowyn and I could only go as far as the castle doors and watch as the wind buffeted the Rohan flag t to a sovereignty denied us. Enter Morford Clark's Galadriel. Told you. Um, ever since the first promotional photos, Amazon never left room for doubt concerning the protagonist of Rings of Power. Clark's turn is as far removed as one can imagine from the Galadriel embodied by the radiant Kate Blanchett. Younger, harsher, a serrated blade suffering from unresolved trauma that spans centuries. Whether she's directly defying the elven king Gil-galad's, Benjamin Walker's, order to return to Valinor, or tempestuously sparring with Halbrand, Charlie Vickers, and Queen Muriel, Cynthia Adai Robinson... She's a fire as brazen as Mount Doom itself, and it's all in the name of her murdered brother, Finrod, Will Fletcher, because her love for him is just that resilient, an avenging ardor tied up so tightly with a personal need for revenge that it's almost impossible to separate the two notions. Defeating the reclusive Sauron will protect the wider world, yes, but it's the loss of her brother that keeps Galadriel committed to her hunt when all others fall into complacency. Yeah, you knew this, this is where it was going, right? I hope you guys been following along. Like, you knew this is where she was going with this. Galadriel's insistent drive for vengeance makes her imperfect, as all characters should be. Ah, okay, yes. So her need for vengeance is okay, because all characters should be imperfect. But yet, if it's a male character who's driven by vengeance and revenge, I dare say you would probably say that is signs of his toxic masculinity. <clears throat> but the response of the elves still leaves much to be desired. Her soldiers mutiny and abandon her in the frozen wastelands of Forad Foradwaith. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Where Galadriel's like, no, nah, we need to leave, leave, leave them to die. You know, they, they, they can't make it through the snow. We need to leave them to die. And then she wonders why the soldiers are like, hey, screw you, lady. But I digress. Gilgalad essentially tells her to shut up and calm down, and her closest friend Elrond, Robert Armeo, pleads with her to obey the king for the sake of her reputation. Nevertheless, Galadriel listens to her heart and defies all odds, and surprise, the woman dismissed as too emotional was right. Sauron survived and lives right under her own nose. And much like Wormtongue to Eowyn, we have another villain who understands our heroine on a piercingly deep level others are incapable of. All others look upon you with doubt, Sauron tells her in the scene that sparked a million spectacular fan fictions. <sighs> Galadriel made a seemingly legitimate connection with, with another weary soul. Now, much like Eowyn to Aragorn, and it's Galadriel's belief in Halbrand as a messianic savior that helped him reach Celebrimbor's Charles, Charles Edward's forge. The Dark Lord would have found the elves regardless, so Galadriel isn't to blame. Ah, and there we go. So we can give her all this agency. We can, you know, sh we've got to make her the main character because, you know, Eowyn wasn't the main character, right? Um, 
but we you know we make Galadriel you know in the insufferable bitch the main character but then even when she makes a mistake well she's not really to blame right you know anyway so Galadriel isn't to blame yet the beauty of her hero's journey is how it balances her mistakes with the acknowledgement that her instincts proved correct and the latter is oddly vindicating since Sauron returning to power obviously isn't a win. Galadriel, Morfred Clark's Galadriel does not go on a hero's journey. Um, I will tell you that right now as a writer, as somebody who's worked on scripts, as somebody who's filmed films, um, she is not on a hero's journey. Not in season one, she's not, because the Galadriel at the beginning of season one is the exact same Galadriel that you get at the end of season one. There is no hero's journey. A hero's journey would require that our hero has changed in some way. Morfid Clark's Galadriel does not. She is all about revenge and hatred for Sauron at the beginning of season one, and by the end of it, she is keeping secrets, big secrets, i.e. that Sauron was here, you know, from Celebrimbor and and the other elves and stuff like that. So don't. No, there's no hero's journey. Sorry, sorry, Kelsey. Sorry. Um, ba 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 ba. Of her hero's journey is how it balances her mistakes with the acknowledgement. Okay, yeah, we read that. Uh, by season's end, she finds the peace necessary to healthily move toward forward from Finrod's death and assume the reasonability of serving as a ring bearer, something her judgment was once too clouded to achieve. <sighs> I ain't even going to touch that because that's so stupid. Um, Eowyn and Galadriel's similarities go deeper than just appearance. Eowyn and Galadriel's surface-level similarities as warrior women with anger issues are clear from the jump, but their thematic struggles also mirror one another, just under a slightly different umbrella. If Eowyn endures Tolkien's version of restrictive sexism, there you go, you knew that was coming, right? You knew Tolkien as sexist was coming in here. What Galadriel encounters is quieter and more insidious for it. Uh, what, uh, pain and decays, um, restrictive sexism? Um, the limitations and trivializations tossed her way aren't based solely upon her gender, but nevertheless strike a chord familiar to many women. So what you're saying is if, if even if it's not gender-based, it's still gender-based? Okay. Um... How many are deemed too emotional or too angry or aren't moving on from grief fast enough, fast enough as if such a thing exists? Eowyn embodied anger, certainly, and gave us a moment that sustained our underfed selves for decades. I wouldn't speak an ill word against her, but the difference between Eowyn as a secondary character and Galadriel as a leading character was more impactful than I could have fathomed. Galadriel's thematic battles are on the same level as ancient myths and legends. Oh, fuck no, they're not. The audience doesn't have to wait for Eowyn's I am no man as beautifully triumphant an arc as that is. Galadriel exists already empowered. There you go. That's my point. From this, the beginning of season one, Galadriel is already, quote unquote, empowered. Same, the, in the same way that she is at the end of season one. There's no hero's journey. At the same time, a hero of any gender might face the same conflicts present in rings, which makes Galadriel's arc even more potent. Women's stories can be just as epic as those belonging to any of Tolkien's males. There's a place for us in a world so beloved it feels grafted onto our souls. Her rage in particular is cathartic. Grieving's a messy process, and Finrod's death endures for Galadriel, poisoning the well of her heart every day. Not even the shores of Valinor would fix her wounds. Unless you read the fucking books and you know that that's where, exactly where Finrod is. Galadriel's hero journey in season one of the Rings of Power should have been her getting on the boat and in going to Valinor. And I know the reasons why she, she doesn't in the books. But... She, she could have just stayed on the boat. She would have run into Finrod in Valinor. End of story. The end. Galadriel now has a happy heart. But anyway, I digress. Um, it's only when she faces the man responsible for the loss that she's able to find closure. And it means the world for a piece of beloved media to reflect a portrait of the grief I'm intimately familiar with. 
Again, I think, Kelsey, you're doing a big, big, big um, written self-insert with this article. Young girls needed Eowyn in 2002, when much of the world around us was unknown and uncertain. In a world of continued oppression and terror, we still need her. We also need Galadriel, no matter what age they are. Eowyn carved out a place for a re-envisioned Lady of Lothlorien, paving the way for when a woman is the face of one of the most popular, hotly debated, and highest budgeted shows in history. Eowyn walked so Galadriel could run, so that countless women no longer felt sidelined by their favorite fandom. It's a dream come true. By the light of Erendil, it feels good. Um, okay, I, I know this has gone on far longer than I had anticipated. So I'm just going to keep my comments brief. And then um, I, I, I can't wait to see what you guys have to say down in the comment section below. But here's what I'm going to say. Um, Miss Madison, Kelsey Madison, is doing a literary self-insert right here. She recognizes that Miranda Otto or Eowyn um, was an empowered woman. Okay. However, it's not the empowerment that Kelsey and others who are, view it through the eyes of 2022, whatever third wave feminist politics would consider empowered. She does not consider a woman to be fully empowered. Um, and that's the, the, the key here, fully empowered, unless you are roughly the equivalent of the half-assed, um, not real, um, completely made up to represent modern feminism, um, Morphid Clark Galadriel. Okay, unless your your woman character is the main character, okay, and she's running around vengeful, spiteful, hateful, okay, literally comes across as completely unlikable and and borderline, you know, egotistical and arrogant and nasty, okay, that's what passes for an empowered woman in. Kelsey Matson's eyes because a woman who quietly works towards the freedoms that she seeks, okay, who who ultimately learned, okay, that the things that she was after, i.e. being able to go out and fight, were not all that they were cracked up to be. And that's the irony here is in, in Eowyn's story, she she spends so much time wanting to to do these things these quote unquote empowered things that when she does it's impactful in terms of the i am no man moment right with the witch king but after that she's she sort of realizes like the folly of it right like you know she's she's she witnesses death right? She sees her uncle Theoden die in her arms. It changes her. You guys who read the books, you know this, okay? It, it, she doesn't just walk away like, yeah, showed him that man. And so, No, she, she's a changed person because of it, because she sees that it's not glory. It's, it's not the glorious life that she thought that, and, and, and that she felt she was being kept out of. You know, she, she, participates in it and she sees it for all its ugliness and all its non-attractiveness right and and it changes it changes Eowyn as a character right and you guys know this um but I, I don't think Kelsey knows that I, I think Kelsey just sees it like you know even the fact that well when they tell Eowyn to protect the women and children Kelsey views that as a negative right like oh yeah they're just giving her the task of protecting the women and children um hello that's what men have been doing for literally the entirety of humanity that's been our job and you're saying that that doesn't count when when a woman gets asked to do that which men have historically done, and it, in Tolkien's work, it gets passed on to to a woman to do during this crucial moment. You view that as a negative. That speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. But anyway, like I said, the video has gone too long. Guys, you know what to do. If you like the video, like the video. 
if you want to share the video i would actually ask that you do that let's let's start spreading the word out let's get this out i know a lot of you guys are also um subscribers to other channels and stuff like that if you could start hyping the channel here so we can start building things up um it would mean the world to me obviously you don't have to nobody's under any obligations but i know like some folks here will point me towards other channels that i may not be aware of to go check out that are like sort of tolkien based um you know if you guys could start hyping hyping the old cutter one channel that that would great be great and i'd appreciate it um if you have not subscribed i would hope that i could earn your subscription with this episode it is the 100th so clearly i'm in this for the long haul um um so i would hope that you would consider subscribing and for those of you who are returning uh subscribers thank you so much you guys are beautiful badasses anyway um let me know what you think down in the comments below i mean do you think miss uh kelsey matson is on to something uh, again Huge fan of Eowyn, huge fan of the empowerment that Eowyn sought and ultimately got, and a huge fan of how it changes her because she sees what a lot of men know, and that is sometimes the idea of self-sacrifice um, is less about the self part and more about the sacrifice. Sometimes, you know, if when you're empowered... Um, that means you've got to take the hit so that those that you're fighting for don't. And, um, and, and Eowyn sort of gets that by the end of the books. Um, and, and, and even in the, the movies, in the extended versions as well. Um, but I don't think Miss Kelsey does. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Do you think um, that, you know, now that, you know, Guy Ladriel is is the the focus that she's empowered and she's a strong woman um or do you just think that they just went too far and they've they turned her into an insufferable bitch i, I don't know how many times i could say it anyway let me know your thoughts it's, it's really interesting again i'm not trying to put down the ladies i'm not trying to set up like the whole men versus women on this subject i think it's an interesting subject i think these are the questions that tolkien despite people like kelsey calling his calling it restrictive sexism i think these are the things that tolkien sort of forces us to think about is your role in the big picture okay but i think what a lot of these modern takes on tolkien miss is that you don't always have to be the main character as a matter of fact you're not the main character in my world kelsey you're not the main character you will never be anything more than an npc okay and in your world the same applies to me in your world i'm nothing but an npc right um, and I think Tolkien forces us to look at that bigger picture. Like it's, it's fine and dandy for us to want the things that we want, but how does that fit in with the grander scheme of things? I think that's ultimately what, what the, the view Tolkien wants us to take on things, but I could be wrong. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. Remember, um, to stay awesome, stay cool, stay safe, and I will see you on the next one.